Somebody say, praise the Lord. <laughs> I want to say, Dr. Ryan Anderson, thank you. That, that's uh, the most cogent analysis I've, 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 I've heard yet about this unusual new thing that's come. Yeah. And, uh, <clears throat> amen. And you, you give us hope because, you, as, as Dr. Han so beautifully said, you're an apostle of common sense. And we've, got to, we've just got to stay constantly going back to common sense. And I, I want to give you all a little bit of hope to remember something, too. You're in the right place. First of all, I look out at you all, and I'm, I'm, I'm encouraged because I feel a little bit like Elijah sometimes, and I know some of you do, too. Elijah got real scared one day. He says, I'm the only one left. <laughs> He's hiding out in a cave. It's just me, Lord. I'm the only one left. And the Lord says, Elijah, cut that out. I got seven... I got 7,000 people back there in Jerusalem that never bent the knee to Baal, and I want you to go minister to them, and I want you to appoint a successor prophet. We are not done yet. All right, amen, right? And you know, the church has seen a lot come and go in 2,000 years. I'm going to just tell you right now, you, we have seen a lot come and go, you know. Nations have risen and fallen. Empires have come and gone, all in the age of the church. Heresies and confusion and schisms and all these things have come and gone all in the age of the church yet still we're here still preaching still proclaiming sometimes from jail but we're still preaching the gospel and I want you to know that you know where is Caesar now you know where is where is Napoleon now where are some of those less than holy Roman emperors now where where, where is the Soviet Socialist Republic now those who announced that they would bury us we ended up reading the funeral rites over them and we're still here preaching the gospel. So again, in times like these, there's only one solution. Preach, 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 and just keep preaching. St. Paul wrote to T T Timothy, he said, Timothy, come on. Preach the gospel in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, console, fulfill your ministry. Fulfill your ministry. And so it is that for, that's for all of us, amen? Just Keep preaching. Reach every soul that you can. Amen. And I want to talk about a way that we need to, I think, maybe improve on. And not, um, you all are above average, first of all. I'm talking a little bit to the choir here. Right? You all are a little bit above average in what I'm about to talk about. But I want to talk about becoming witnesses to the normal Christian life. What's our overall theme? Christ, the power and the wisdom of God. Christ, the power and the wisdom of God. Now, how many of you know that Christ has a power in your life? See? Now, I, I, th I thought you might jump to your feet and say, Amen, preacher. Is there something wrong? Is this not working? Uh, see how hesitant we are sometimes to say, listen, brothers and sisters, if you've really met the Lord Jesus Christ, you can't go away unchanged. <laughs> He's working in your life, and you know that he's the power and the wisdom of God. You've, and I, I say no, I don't just mean intellectually no. I mean it like the biblical knowing, an experiential knowing. I'm a changed man since I met Jesus. Are you a changed person? How is he working in your life? What's he doing in your life? Brothers and sisters, Scripture is not simply some slogan. Scripture is a prophetic declaration of reality. And one of the things scripture says is that if anyone is in Christ, he, she is a new creation. A new creation. And we've got to get in touch with how that's happening in our life and then become witnesses to others. See, one of the dangers is that we're content to quote saints, we're content to quote other people. We heard a, an interesting thing at a talk and we'll quote, well, I heard so-and-so say, uh, I, I heard a tape by Dr. Scott Hahn and he says this and okay, Okay, but there has to come a moment in your life when you can say, yes, the scripture says, my pastor says, my mother said, Dr. Han says, but there has to come a point in your life when you have to raise up your hand and say, and I say, and I also say, I add my amen, that everything that the church teaches and proclaims and teaches down through the centuries is true because in the laboratory of my own life, I've come to find that it's true. I've tested it in the laboratory of my life, and I know that it's true that sacraments work, that prayer works, that, 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 that getting to Mass and praying works. I know it because it's changing my life. 
Do you have a testimony? So let's talk for a minute about what does it mean to be a witness? And what do we mean by this normal Christian life or this, this transformative Christian life? Well, first of all, what does it mean to be a witness? To be a witness means that you are able to testify to what you yourself have seen and heard and experienced. Now go with me to a courtroom. And let's say that you're in the witness stand and you've been sworn in and one of the attorneys says to you, did you see such and so do so and so, or such, did you see so and so do such and so to so and so? And you go, um, I think so. Does that sound like a witness? Yeah. Why don't you get off the stand? You're making our case worse here. Did you see, what, did you see it happen? Um, I think so. Hmm. Well, let's, let's try another example. So there you are, you're in the witness box and um, you know, you, you say, did you, they ask you the same question. Did you see, you know, such and so happen? Um, well, that guy over there told me, no, no, I don't want to know what that guy said. I want to know what you saw. Well, that lady over there, uh-uh. Okay, I'll tell you what. You get off the stand. Let's get that other man sworn in. Let's get that other lady over here. You see, a witness says what they themselves have seen and heard. So here's a witness. You're in the witness box. You raise your right hand. You've been sworn in. And they ask you a question. Did you see so-and-so do such-and-so to so-and-so? And you said, yes, and I'll swear to it. That's a witness. Yes, and I'll swear to it. And you see, the Lord doesn't just want us to <clears throat> repeat what other people have said. He wants you in the laboratory of your own life to know and get to know him and what he's doing in your life so that you can personally testify that Jesus Christ is alive and well and he's changing my life. My life will never be the same because Jesus Christ has died for me and risen, that the power of the cross to put sin to death and bring grace alive in my life is true because it's happening in my life. And so it is that we, I think, as Catholics, are not as good at that as others, being witnesses. You know, I think that uh, there's a lot of traditions that even people sometimes come up and they give testimonies. Here's what the Lord is doing in my life. And <laughs> those who've been in the Protestant churches know that some of those stories get a little exaggerated. I was the worst of sinners. I was the, no worse sinner than me. And Jesus saved me. Now I am, I'm just perfect from top to bottom. Uh, false in others I can see, but praise the Lord, there's none in me. <laughs> you know, no, no, there could be a little exaggeration, right? Hmm? But no, you see, what, to be honest, look, what is Jesus Christ doing in your life? Now, most of you are faithful to getting to Mass every Sunday, and maybe even more often. And you're praying, and you're studying your faith, and you're reading Scripture. So what's that doing in your life? How's it changing? How's it changing you? I promise you it is. Now, the devil wants to take away the knowledge, but I promise you it is. Now, what is the normal Christian life? Now, when I say normal, I don't mean statistical normal, that almost everybody gets here. I'm talking about normative normal. The, the life that Jesus Christ died to give you, what is it? First of all, it is to be in a life-changing, transformative relationship with Jesus Christ. It's to be in living, conscious contact with the Lord all throughout your day. That's the normal Christian life. When I was a younger man, I could go for days, sometimes weeks, without ever thinking of God. That's not normal. You might say I was, I wasn't so much running a temperature, I was, my, my body temperature had tanked, right? The normal Christian life is to be powerfully aware of the Lord every day and joyfully aware of what he's doing in my life. And even in the struggles and the difficulties that I'm going through, that somehow I know, Lord, that even my struggles are producing good things for me. For the Bible said, I did check it this morning, y'all. I looked it up just to make sure that the Holy Spirit had not blotted out the text. It is still in Romans 8 and verse 28 that all things work together for good for those who love and trust the Lord. Now, still in their church, so that even the difficult things, even the painful things in your life, somehow they work for your good. You've got a testimony, don't you? Um, uh, I think so. Um. Brothers and sisters, 
we've got to get better at being witnesses. We've got to get in touch with the normal Christian life, right? Which again, let me just review some qualities of it, all right? I'm going to read you some scriptures in a minute to fill it in, but it's to be in a life-changing, transformative relationship with God, with the Lord. It's to be in living conscious contact with the Lord throughout your day, aware of his presence, knowing what he's doing for you, and having a powerful sense of it. It's to be seeing our lives dramatically changed and transformed by the power of the cross to put sin to death and to bring virtues and graces alive. It's to know the Lord, not just know about him. You know the difference, right? Do you know, do you know the Lord or you just know about him? You've heard what somebody else said about him. You know, sadly, for too many people, God is really a stranger. They don't really know him personally. They've heard about him. Sometimes they call out to him, but he's sort of a stranger up there. That's not the normal Christian life. The normal Christian life is to powerfully encounter the presence of the Lord in moments like this, in mass, throughout the day, in the beauty of creation, and yes, even in the painful crosses and difficulties, to know his abiding presence and the glory of his truth, to be like a light shining in dark days, is to know that and treasure it and be powerfully aware of what it's doing for you. You see, again, how could it be, though, that the Lord would die on the cross for us and that so many of us would still be struggling with a kind of a tepid spirituality, sort of a mediocre moral life, boredom and worldliness and so forth. Is that the best that the death of the Son of God can do for you? That we should be, you know, like, let me just soldier on and just hope I get into heaven barely. Okay, well, but is that the best that the death of the Son of God can do for you? Don't you think he could do something a little better? to give you joy and give you enthusiasm and, and, and bring you alive with confidence and serenity and joy. So again, you see, brothers and sisters, we, we need to look for and have high expectations of the life that the Lord died to give us. And I'm not that convinced that many people do have high expectations of their Catholic and Christian life. It's more of a soldiering on Let's hope things aren't that bad and let's hope things get a little better and maybe I'll make it into heaven. Okay. Well, if that's all you got, go with it, okay? But I want you to know I'm a witness that the Lord can do more for you. <laughs> now, let me give you a little bit of my background. You know, I, I was raised a very traditional Catholic like many of you and, and um, I, 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 among other things, I love the old Latin Mass. I, I'm, I, I've been celebrating it for all 30 years of my priesthood. I was back for an, under the first indult, you know? I mean, you know? <clears throat> and uh, so I, I was able to do, I was one of the designated priests back in the days when you had to celebrate it quietly in a back room somewhere. Yeah. Okay. But so I, I, I love that tradition, but I've also had another experience in my life where I've been in largely African-American parishes. And I want you all to know, uh, it's a wonderful, joyful experience to be in an African-American parish. They're very serious about their worship. And they have high expectations. You walk into an African-American parish on Sunday morning and there's something called the hum. There's an energy in the room. People say, ooh, we're going to get a word today from the Lord. He's going to, say, he's going to speak through your preacher. I said, I hope so, I hope so, pray for me, you know. Uh, but there's joyful singing. The choir begins and we don't stop singing until the Spirit says stop. And there's a, there's a high expectation of the preaching moment, the word, and also to receive the living God. So my heart's filled with joy. And I learned, I've learned so much to expect and to have high expectations. So much of the music sings of liberation and sings of joy in the Lord and of freedom, a freedom that the world didn't give and the world can't take away. And so much of that, and the, thing, the thing I love about gospel music is that it's all about God. It's almost never about us. It's all about God. And so I, I, I've had that influence, and over the years I've, I've been very, very aware of the powerful, powerful work of the Lord in the liturgy to save and set me free, and I've been trained to have high expectations of what the Lord can do for me. Now, do you, 
do you? I, like you, have been through difficulties, but I've also been delivered out of those difficulties. I've had difficult, painful times in my life. In my mid-30s, I was, had a nervous breakdown. I was in, in the psych ward for a whole week. I hit the wall. I was sent to a parish to be a pastor as a young priest, and I wasn't ready, and I was overwhelmed, and I just had panic attacks. I, couldn't, I just couldn't stop. I, I just couldn't sleep for days, and on and on. So I was hospitalized. It was the worst moment in my life, and it was the best moment in my life. You know, I was right in the right place. They sent me back to the parish where I'd come from, to Holy Comforter, my parish where I am still now. And those folks, they, they said, Whoa, we're going to have to pray for him. And they surrounded me, and they prayed for me, and they sang for me, and they said, it's going to be all right. It's going to be all right, Pastor. It's going to be all right. And they prayed, and they sang me back to health. I always stand before my people now, and I say to them, for you, for you, I am your pastor. With you, I am your brother. But from you, I'm your son because you've so formed me spiritually over these years. I feel like you've raised me up. I always say to the folks there that says that they took me in, they trained me up, and they turned me out. <laughs> when I say turn me out, I don't mean sent me out somewhere else, but I mean, they, you know, you, you, St. Augustine says that we're in Cravatus and say we're, we're sort of turned in on ourselves because of sin. And one of the goals is to be turned out toward God and toward others, giving and receiving love to be a man, a woman for others, and to find such joy in loving and serving God. And I've learned to have high expectations. And you know, after many years of psychotherapy, but also prayer, spirituality, spiritual direction, deliverance ministry, all these things, my own prayer, I want you to know I'm almost never anxious about things anymore. It's gone. I've been delivered. See? And I've seen so many positive things come alive. I'm more serene, I'm more confident, I'm more joyful. I have gifts that I never knew I had, and now I use them. And so I can only just say, thank you, Lord. And I've learned to just know that, I, I'll just I'll quote a gospel song here. I'm not what I want to be, but I'm not what I used to be. <laughs> I am not what I want to be, but I am not what I used to be. A change, a change has come over me. There's so many beautiful things that we sing about in gospel music about deliverance and there's so many ways of just uh, being excited about you know, what the Lord's doing in our life. One of the songs that we sing in my church and many a Sunday is, uh, it just says, he's done so much for me, I cannot tell it all. I cannot tell it all. Oh, brothers and sisters, it's a, beautiful, we just, it's a song you have to kind of dance while you sing, he's done so much for me. Anyway, well, I would <laughs> bore you with that. Another song just says, and these are old gospel songs, you know, great change since I've been born. There's been a great change since I've been born. Hmm? Places I used to go, I don't go no more. Things I used to do, I don't do it no more because there's a great change since I've been born. Another song says, when I look back over my life and I think things over, I can truly say that I've been blessed. I've got a testimony. I've got a testimony. Another old song just says, I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, deep, very deeply stained within and sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry and from the waters lifted me and now safe am I. Love lifted me when nothing else could help. Love lifted me. You see, there's some of those old hymns and things really train people on how to testify. And to some degree, we don't sing a lot of those kinds of songs. I, I saw we sang some of them tonight, speaking about how the Lord's delivered us. We've got to learn and internalize those songs, but to use them as kind of a model, a model. Another one is a famous, I, I actually put a whole catechetical program around the opening lines of this song. I once was lost in sin, but Jesus took me in. And then a little light from heaven filled my heart. He bathed my heart in love and wrote my name above. And just a little talk with Jesus made me whole. These are, these are ways that we can train in giving some testimony. You know, I can only just say, and I, I'm so powerfully aware now, one of the greatest gifts God has given me in mo more recent times is just this immense gratitude. I am so grateful to God for what he's done for me. I'm just so grateful. 
And you know, grateful people are different. You know, every Sunday at Mass, Jesus says something to you. He says, remember. Sometimes I think it's right now in our current translation, do this in memory of me. What does it mean to remember? You know, the Greek idea there is anamnesis, right? It's not just some intellectual fact you have filed on the back of your brain, but rather it is that something, something ancient is made present to you now. That's what we do in every Mass. The power of the cross and his resurrection is made present to us in every Mass. And so Jesus says a critical thing to all of us in every Mass. He says, remember. Do this in memory of me. What does it mean to remember? To remember means to have so present to my mind and heart what God has done for me so that I'm grateful and different. Grateful people are different people. They're more generous, they're more kind, they're less anxious, they're less fearful. You know, think about the last time you were really grateful, excited about something. Somebody asked you for 20 bucks, you gave them them 40, you know? There's just something about gratitude as a doorway to immense change in our life. I think that's why we call it the Holy Eucharist, the Holy Thanksgiving. The Lord says, never forget what I've done for you. Always have present to your mind and your heart what I've done for you so that you are grateful and that you're different. Now I'm asking you, are you a witness? It's too easy for us just to recite formulas and what other people have said, quoting the saints, quoting the scripture, please do, those are good things. And by the way, don't ever form your own religion. <laughs> it's, it's, it's bad for other people and you'll go to hell, okay? <laughs> but what I'm asking you when it comes to making our testimonies, what we're testifying to is this, I got my right hand raised now. Everything that the scriptures say and declare and everything that the church has taught down through the centuries is true because in the laboratory of my own life, I have tested it and I found that it's true. My life is changing. My, 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 my whole life is different because I've given my life to the Lord and because of the sacraments. Now, a lot of parents come to me and they say, Father, I sent my kid to Catholic school. I sent them to, I, I, I tried to give them everything and none of them go to church now. What am I supposed to do? You know. Now, you know, back when I was a kid, my mom could talk to me like this. I say, maybe it's a holy day comes along and I say, we're going to church today. Well, I want to go to church today. Why are we going to go to church today? And the answer was, it's a rule. Oh, okay, it's a rule. <laughs> and we got, we got already to go to church. Now, the argument from authority may have carried some weight before the cultural revolution of the, of the 60s, right? But now, the fact that it's a rule is even another additional reason not to do it, right? So what are you going to do to get your kids back to church? So here's my question to all of you and my, the way I say to some of the folks in my own parish. How am I going to get my kids to go to church? Well, why do you go to church? What do you get out of it? Oh, um, maybe I feel less guilty. I checked off the box, you know, check off the God box. Why do you go to Mass? Do you have a testimony? Now, look, I'll tell you why I go to Mass. You go, well, Father, you got to go to Mass. You're a priest. <laughs> okay, but I want you to know why I really go to Mass. I go to Mass. Because when I walk in there, I'm in God's house, and Jesus Christ puts on priestly robes, and he walks the aisle of my church, and he goes to the, he goes to the, altar, he goes to the altar, and he greets me, and he listens to me, and he speaks a word to me, and he ministers to me, and he feeds me with his body and blood, and I'm filled with joy. That's why I go to Mass. Why do you go to Mass? Is that why you go to Mass? I go to Mass to encounter Jesus Christ. He puts on priestly robes and he ministers to me. He speaks a word to me that changes my heart, that answers my questions, that gives me healing and grace. And then he takes his ordinary bread and wine and he turns it into his own body and blood and he feeds me with his own body and blood. I can't begin to tell you what a difference that's made in my life. Brothers and sisters, I'll continue on with my testimony. For 
the first 20 some years of my life, I would say I was not very spiritual. But once I finally entered the seminary, I want you to know, I pray every day for at least an hour. I get to confession once a week, get to mass every day. I read God's word every day and I walk in holy fellowship. And I want you to know I'm a changed man. Now I'm not what I wanna be, but I'm not what I used to be. I got a long way to go, but he's brought me a mighty long way, a mighty long way. I'm more confident, I'm more joyful, I'm more serene, I'm happier. My life is more meaning and purpose, and even my sufferings, I understand them now in a way I never did before. And even in difficult and dark days, I feel sustained by the Lord. Oh, that's why I go. Now, I'm just trying to model for you what it sounds like to testify. And I want you to know, let's just get back to our children for a minute. Parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, your children are hungry to hear something like that from you. We Catholics had a bad attitude. We, we don't talk about religion in the house. We leave that to the priests and the nuns over there at the church. Really? And again, do, you, do your children know how much you love the Lord and how good he's been? Do they know your story? Now, Dr. Ralph Martin, who many of you know and love, as you know, he teaches at the seminary up in Sacred Heart in Detroit, and he, um, he has a little rule for most of the seminarians that he teaches. He says, I want all of you to put, get your testimony together. Now, I want the three to five minute elevator version, all right? I don't want the long 25 minute version, okay? But he says, I want you to put your testimony together. I want to know how you met Jesus Christ and what he's been doing for you. And don't give me your vocation story, he says, because some of you are hiding behind that. Your vocation story is important, and I'm glad, but I want to know how have you met Jesus Christ and what is he doing in your life? And I want you to be very personal about it. And every day they begin class, one of them has to stand up and give the three to five minute elevator version. A lot of Catholics are embarrassed to say how they met Jesus Christ or maybe that they, they really haven't ever really met him. What do you mean met him, Father? I mean, I don't know, I hear about him in a book. I mean, I, I hear about him in the liturgy, you know, I mean. Uh... Listen, if that's the case, you need to get on your knees and say, Lord, reveal yourself to me. Now he's right in front of you, yes, in every liturgy. If you're, if you're prepared to accept it, he's talking to you right now. If, if God can speak through Balaam's donkey, he can even speak through me. <laughs> All right. We've got to sometimes look. And that doesn't mean we all have some kind of vision like, you know, Margaret Alacoque or, you know, or, you know Sister Faustina or someone. But, but to know that he's present and active in my life and to know how he's doing and what he's doing for me and how my life has changed because I'm walking in this way. This is what our world is desperate to hear from us. I'm afraid that too often we come across as Catholics more about what we're against than what we're for. And that's not always fair. We have to speak out against moral evils of our day. Of course we do. We just heard a beautiful talk. But we have to also be known what we're for. That we're for marriage and for family and for chastity and beauty and the innocence of our children. That we're for temperance and the beautiful gifts of, 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 of being masters over our anger and all the retribution. And we're, we love forgiveness and mercy and we're joyful to receive back people who have hurt and offended us. These are great, beautiful things. The whole moral vision of the New Testament is that God can so change your life that you even love your enemy. You might even love your spouse. <laughs> that you can have authority over your thought life. That you don't want to divorce your spouse because you love them. That you, again, that I could go on and on the whole Sermon on the Mount. It is the picture of the transformed human person. It's not, don't do this and don't do that, and by gosh, don't do that. No, it's the opposite. Jesus is saying, do you understand what will happen in your life when I lay hold of you and begin to change you by my grace? Again, the whole Sermon on the Mount is a picture of the transformed human person. They're poor in spirit, whatever that means. <laughs> you know, sometimes you look at the Sermon on the Mount and you say, oh my gosh, uh, I gotta be poor in spirit, I gotta be meek, I gotta be merciful. Oh man, this is hard. Um, let's see. Uh, oh man, let me turn the page and see what else we got here. You know what I mean? <laughs> because you're thinking that out of your own flesh power that you have to accomplish all that. 
that you've got to love your enemy, that you've got to not retaliate, and that you, you've got to get married and stay married, and you have to have authority over your thought life and not even entertain impure thoughts, and, and that you need to tell the truth and speak the truth and say yes when you mean yes and no when you mean no and never swear falsely, and you're like, oh, I'm overwhelmed, I'm scared, I can't pull it off. Let me just see what's on TV tonight. <laughs> I need a drink, you know? Because you're thinking that you have to do it. No, this is God's work in you. This is the power of grace and the power of the cross to put sin to death. And the Lord says, when I'm finished with you, you're going to look like this. This is increasingly your life. If you will let me live my life in you, you will start to see these things come into into place. And I'm a witness, y'all. There are people in my family who hurt me. And somewhere, I just woke up one morning and I, I, I just felt I had forgiven them. And it wasn't my work. Now, not, it took me some years going to Al-Anon meetings and stuff to let go of some of the hurts. I'm not going to get into all the details, and I'm just going to tell you right now, it is possible to feel powerful forgiveness in your life. And it's not your work. It's God's gift to you. It's God saying, look, I saw everything they did, and I promise you, if they die unrepentant, they'll answer to me for it. Let's hope they don't. But you give it to me now and be free. And I'm a witness. I've been able to let go of some of these things. These things have hurt me deeply. I hope some of you have experienced the same thing. I could give you hundreds of examples, but I just want you to know that the Sermon on the Mount is Jesus' promise to you that increasing your life will be like this if you just let his grace go to work in you. And let your life become like a laboratory and say, well, Lord, it says here in this Sermon on the Mount that... um, um, that I, 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 I'm not to divorce my wife, uh, but what you're really telling me is that I have the capacity to really love my wife or my husband. Lord, let's, let's try that out. I need some help. Help me to really love my spouse with a tender, beautiful love that I had when I first laid eyes on them. Let's go to work, Lord. I need help. I need to love some of my children who have disappointed me and I'm angry with some of them. You go to the Lord and talk to him. Let him go to work in these things. It may not happen instantly, but you go and you talk to him about it. And then when you you see it happen, you make sure you testify about it. I once was lost in sin. There were people I was so hurt and so angry I could never forgive them. And now I have. And it's not me, it's Jesus. And he's been so good to me. People have come out of addictions, to pornography, to alcohol, to other drugs. They've got testimonies. They stand in rooms and church basements all over this country talking about how they've been set free. Why don't we talk more like that? So we've got a testimony to give. The Lord's doing something in your life. And it's good and it's important for you to get in touch with that. And then see. Now let me read you some scriptures that talk about the normal Christian life. And let me remind you that as I read them, that scripture is not just a bunch of slogans or hallmark sayings that are meant to just make you feel a little better. Scripture is a prophetic declaration of reality. This is what's really going on. This is what's really possible for you if you will take it seriously. So here we are. This is, um, again, we see the, um, uh, this, this particular passage is from, we actually read it in the breviary yesterday. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And verse 17, if anyone is in Christ, he, she, is a new creation. The old things have passed away, and behold, all things are made new. Is that just a slogan? Or is that a prophetic statement of reality that's available to you if you will just lay hold of it and take it seriously? What is new in your life? What are the old things that have been put away? And what are the new things that have come alive? This world needs to hear from you and me what those new things are and the old things that you've been able to set aside by the power of God's grace and only by the power of God's grace. I love the Lord. He's been so good to me. He's done great things in my life. Old things went away and new things have come alive. Or again, we see in Romans chapter 6, the mini gospel, right? Are you not aware that we who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? And by baptism, we were buried together with him so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of God the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Are you walking in newness of life? How? Let the Lord anoint you. 
to know what he's done for you. He's telling you, you walk in newness of life. I've taken you out of the kingdom of darkness and I've brought you into the kingdom of light. What's that doing for you? Does it give you clarity? Does it give you joy? Are you in touch with that at all? Remember, Satan wants to rob you of this. Or again, I'll read another one here uh, from Scripture. We see that, um, um, yeah, the, the, this is from uh, 2 Corinthians in the third chapter. And we, who with unveiled faces reflect the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory that comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Again, we are being transformed into God's likeness with ever-increasing glory. Is that happening in your life? How? What's he doing for you? Are there some sins he's put to death? Are there some graces he's brought alive? Maybe a joy you never thought possible? What's, what's he doing in your life? These are the questions that we need to ask. But you see, these are describing the normal Christian life which is to be in a life-changing, transformative relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. I tell you just one example. If you are reading Scripture faithfully every day, meditating upon it, your whole thinking will change. The way you think. I'm not, I don't think in the same way I did 35, 40 years ago before I got serious about my spiritual life. I have completely different priorities. What I, what I value is completely different. I don't see people the same way. I don't see anything the same way. I see it in a better way, in God's way. The Lord wants to allow, just transform our minds. You just sit with scripture and I promise you a new mind. And so a thought, reap a deed. So a deed, reap a habit. So a habit, reap a character. And so a character and reap a destiny. And it all begins in your mind. Get on your knees every day and say, Lord, speak. Your servant is listening. I'm a witness. I am not the man I used to be because of the word of God, just reading that word day in and day out and then receiving the word made flesh in the Eucharist. It's made every bit of difference in my life. So these things are describing the normal Christian life, to be in a life-changing, transformative relationship with the Lord, to be in living, conscious contact with him, to be joyfully, powerfully aware that he exists, that he's active in my life, and I can articulate what he has done for me and what he is doing for me. And we shine forth as men and women of hope. Even in difficult moments, we all go through them. There's Deep down, there's a, 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 he kindles a fire that never dies away. Now, I want to say, to read just a couple of other things from the liturgy, just so you know that even in the liturgy, we speak about these things. This is from the Easter preface, number four. For with the old order destroyed, a universe cast down is renewed, and integrity of life has been restored to us. That is a prophetic declaration of a different life, of integrity that's been offered to you in Jesus Christ. Or again, this is from the fourth Sunday of Easter. Grant, we pray, O Lord, that we may always find delight in these paschal mysteries so that the renewal constantly at work within us may be the cause of our unending joy. Now, you, you know, here's the danger. You know, you're sitting there at the liturgy and the priest says, let us pray. And you go, uh-huh. And you're tuned out and maybe he's even tuned out. <laughs> Listen to these words again because this was said to you several times during the last Easter season. Grant, we pray, O oh Lord, that we may always find delight, not boredom. You know, sometimes you look at a Catholic mass and you think, man, are we at a funeral or a wedding? What are we dealing with here, you know? <laughs> Bored believers, distracted disciples, the frozen chosen, you know? The frozen chosen. Right. Okay. Now, look, I, I don't mean everyone's got to be like, ah, you know, giddy. Uh, I know that there's a, there's a certain piety, but, I mean, do you find, are you, is your heart alive and joyful? Are you thinking, oh, i got to remember to get to the store and get some more chicken broth because, you know. You, you. Okay. So, okay, so, so the priest is praying. Lord, grant that we may always find delight in these Easter mysteries so that the renewal, the renewal constantly at work within us may be the source of our unending joy. You see, the priest, who is really Jesus, 
is inviting you to be in touch with the normal Christian life, to see your life being changed, the renewal constantly at work, giving you a joy and a confidence. Happy to announce that the Lord's been so good to me. And so again, what I would say that if we're going to defend the faith, we, don't want, to, we, we want to master the arguments. We don't just want to win arguments, of course. We want to win souls. We've heard this. But, but one of the ways you win souls is not just by overpowering them with information, but by showing them the beautiful gift that these truths are changing your life and making you joyful and different. And the question is how? And that's for you to get on your knees and ask the Lord about. Do you have a testimony? And what is that testimony? Let me just be Dr. Ralph Martin for you right now. I want every one of you to get on your knees and ponder what the Lord's done. I want to find out how did you meet Jesus Christ? How do you know God the Father and the Holy Spirit? And what are they doing in your life? And give us the three to five minute elevator version. <laughs> but I have a, I, on my blog, I have a, a longer version, you know, about a, I would call it my, 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 my 20 minute version. I also have my three to five minute elevator version. And you can go to my blog and find out writing your testimony and you can, you can study up on that a little bit. I just want you to know that's my story, but you've got your story. Now, every now and again, when I talk like this, people kind of get sad because I say, man, that's, I don't know. I don't know if he's done anything for me. I've had a miserable life, and I just don't know. I feel kind of depressed sometimes, you see. If that's the case, I want you to again get back on your knees and say, Lord, I know that you did not send your son to die for me so that all I could do is be depressed and bored and not happy with how my life has gone. Lord, you have been good to me in ways I don't even know or understand right now. Please anoint my mind. Anoint my heart. Because I'm in a world, Lord, that desperately needs to hear how good you are and that your truth is freeing, not limiting. I've been free. To teach me how you have freed me by your law, by your truth, by the beautiful wisdom. Jesus Christ, you are the power and the wisdom of God. And that wisdom, that law, that vision is meant to save me and change me and transform me. Brothers and sisters, the word of God doesn't simply inform, it performs and it transforms. In fact, the very word gospel, if you get Cardinal Ratzinger's book, he wrote it as Pope Benedict, but he says, I'm just Joe Ratzinger here, it's just my view, but so he didn't write it as the Pope, that he was clear to say that, but he says that about, chapter, about page 44 of volume one, he talks about the, the word gospel, evangelion. And he says how, you know, the ancient emperors they, um, they, would, um, they would issue these things called evangelion, which meant, you know, we translate, you know, this word evangelium or evangelion as good news in, in modern English, but that doesn't really quite get to the depths of what it is. It's richer and deeper than that. The word gospel, the emperors would, let's give, let me give you an example. Let's say the emperor says, uh, the town crier comes and he reads, he says, good news, good news, the emperor is raising taxes. <laughs> He would say, Evangelion, Evangelion, the emperor is raising taxes. Now, it's not particularly cheerful news, but what it is, is it's life-changing. Your life is going to be different now because the emperor spoke. You got it? Now, he might also come to town crier and say, good news, good news, the emperor is paving the road between here and uh, Laodicea. Well, that is good news. But the point is not so much that it's good or happy or cheerful, but that it's life-changing. Now, what the emperors falsely claim for themselves is really true here that when the Lord speaks that this word is not so much always cheerful. Sometimes the Lord may have to say, repent. And I love some of those gospels where we say, bring those people who didn't want me to be their king into my presence and slay them in my presence. The gospel of the Lord. Now oh, praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> so my, my only point in saying all that to you is that that it's not necessarily just cheerful and always happy or good in an immediate sense. But what it is, is life-changing. It's transformative. And that brings you to a place of healing. If you will sit with devotion and reflectively, devotedly read the Word of God, it will heal you of deep drives of sin. It will 
he will, it will remove error and confusion. You know, we spend so much of our time majoring in all the minors. We maximize the minimum and we minimize the maximum. Our, our world is so full of stinking thinking that if you don't clean your mind with the powerful word of God, you know, our minds are like a sponge. And if you put a sponge in dirty water, it's coming out dirty. Don't kid yourself. So how do you clean a dirty sponge? You plunge it into clean water and you wring it out and back into the clean water and you wring it out. And the clean water is God's word and the teachings of the church. And I promise you, promise you, promise you, I've got my hand, I'm swearing it as an oath that if you will do that faithfully, spend time each day, it'll change your life because it's changed my life. My priorities are different. I see people differently. I understand suffering in a way I never did before. I understand the beauty and the glory of God as I never did before. The human person, I could go on and on and on. But I simply say to you, it'll change your life. And many of you are already well aware of this. And so I ask you, are you able and willing to testify, to be joyful witnesses? Every now and again, I'll go into the safe way nearby my parish and what's been a traditionally African-American parish. As some of you may know, the whole city of Washington is like changing overnight. But back, in the, back a few years ago when it was still a solidly black neighborhood, I'd go into the Safeway and someone would see me in my, in my, with my witness clothes here and say, Preacher, you got a word for me today? <laughs> Whew, I better be on my toes. I better have a word for him. Amen? I mean, but again, people want to hear from us. What's that so let me just give you a couple real quick evangelical moments not to overlook because I think it's important for us and I, gotta, I just got about three minutes left but I want to say sometimes we miss the most important evangelical moment of the day and it happens at least a dozen times a day maybe even more. Someone will come to you and they'll say, how you doing? And you say something like, fine. <laughs> what a wasted opportunity. And again, I learned this in the safe way. Because African Americans in the Safeway would never say fine. You say, how you doing today? Oh, I'm blessed and highly favored. <laughs> or they'll say, mm, blessed and passing them on to you. Or I'm more blessed than I deserve. Or, I'm blessed for a sinner. Now, that's a beautiful way to just have a quick evangelical moment with a person. A simple, how you doing? I am so blessed. God's been so good to me. Or as Chris Deponic was saying earlier, just a simple... Uh, God bless you instead of, you know, okay, see you later. You know, the, you, you walk out the store, you see somebody and you say hi. Instead of just saying hi, say, God bless you. you know, I almost always, when I'm on the phone, you know, with somebody, I, I always end, God bless you. I was talking to the insurance company the other day. I had to get my new car, you know, you know, all that stuff. At the end of it, I say, thank you so much for your help and God bless you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> A simple moment like that. And you start to signal, and then you are, you're not just giving them a blessing, but you're signaling them, I'm open and available to talk to you about the Lord. And you'll be surprised. Some people say, oh, do you know the Lord? Or do you go to church? What's your church? Oh, let me tell you about my church. I have met, the Lord's been good to me. He's been so good to me. So you see, you open up these opportunities in just those little evangelical moments. So again, I, I simply leave you with some of these thoughts. I, I think that if we're going to defend the faith, we don't want to just defend the faith. We want to, if you will, joyfully offer and joyfully announce the faith. I know that's what we're really about in a, in a conference like this. Yes, we have to hone the arguments and hone the skills. And yes, we got to do that. Stay close to the material. Listen to a lot of Catholic answers live. And, you know, by the way, I wrote a book called Catholic and Curious. It's in the bookstore. You can get it. 501 questions and answers on the Catholic faith, you know. It's down there. I also got a book on the Ten Commandments down there in the bookstore, you know. But, you know, Catholic and Curious. So I'm, I'm very much into it. We've got to know the arguments. We've got to have right answers for people. But above all, it's not enough simply to have right answers if you don't seem joyful or happy about them. Well, um, you know, gee, um, do I really have to go to church on Sunday? Yes, you do. Because it's a mortal sin if you don't go to Mass. Okay, well, that's a correct answer. Uh, but, but how about a little more joy? <laughs> it's, you know, it's a mortal sin because God's just so good to us. I mean, how could we ever turn him down on an opportunity to just come and thank him? He deserves our praise. He is worthy of our praise. Oh, 
You see, then you're more joyful and you're, you're announcing, you're speaking the truth, but you're speaking it with a, not just with a love, but with a joy. You're excited to say, yes, the answer is true. It's true, yes, we need to be at Mass on Sunday, of course, but I wouldn't be anywhere else. Oh, he's been too good to me. I just, I'll tell you what, you come and go with me next Sunday. See? See how different it is than just, you know, okay. Well, I'm, I got 29 seconds according to the clock. So, <laughs> brothers and sisters, it is a joy to be with you. I've already, I know that I'm talking to a group that's above average about all this stuff. I'm, re, I'm mainly just reminding many of you things you already know. But I do tell you that as a group, we Catholics are like way below average in this ability to testimony, to testify, to be witnesses, joyful witnesses. And the theme of our conference today is, or this weekend is again, Christ, the power and the wisdom of God. How can you joyfully say he is the power of God? And I know it because he's doing it in my life and he is the wisdom because he's changing the way I think. Amen.